witness for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I really appreciate your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, when parents begin exercising their right to question their local school boards during the height of COVID, uh, amid mass mandates, woke curricula, and harassment in schools, how did the DOJ respond? The Department of Justice responded it under Merrick Garland with directing the public to report threats of violence to school board members, officials, and workers in our national public schools to a national hotline. One particular case, a mom was reported to the hotline uh, as a threat because she was A, a conservative, and B, she was a lawful gun owner, like myself. The complainant alleged that the mom was a threat because she belonged to a right-wing group known as Moss for Liberty. And I have a real problem with identifying people like this because it's your right to belong to whoever you want to belong to, and that's your freedoms. Another investigation opened because a tip to the hotline, a, a dad was investigated uh, because according to the complainant, the dad fit the profile of an insurrectionist. I don't really know what that means, but it's, that's interesting and he had a lot of guns and threatened to use them. Yet when the FBI asked about the complainant about these threats from the dad, the complainant admitted that no specific information or observations or any crimes of threats. According to the FBI, not one of these school board related investigations resulted in federal arrest or charges, not a single one. Recently, the DOJ announced that they were going to continue to prosecute people from January 6th to the tune of around 1,000 more people to be charged in the not-so-distant future. Now, January 6th was over two years ago, and the DOJ is still looking to charge more people. Yet, when there is a true domestic terror threat like Antifa, the DOJ did not direct people to a national hotline, nor did they report these threats to our communities. Now, my colleagues on the left will tell you that Antifa doesn't exist. It's an idea. Uh, but I, my question is, is, where is the intellectual curiosity to determine how Antifa, a highly coordinated domestic terrorist organization, is funded and organized? The DOJ did not set up a hotline for Antifa. They set up a hotline for you. No federal resources were set aside to investigate the violence that we saw unleashed across this country during the Summer of Love in 2020. Please note some of these photos. That's, wait a minute, that's not January 6th. That's May 31st, 2020. That's right in front of the White House. That's where the president lives. And at the time, President Trump was ushered into a bunker because his life was being threatened. Where was the hotline? Next photo. <laughs> that's not January 6th either. That's July 27th. That is in Portland. And that is Antifa rioting and pillaging our country. Where was the hotline? Next slide. Well, hot damn. <laughs> That's not January 6th either. Those are more rioters that are destroying and rioting in Salt Lake City. Next slide. I believe that, is that it? We're, we're, <laughs> but wait, there's more. And that's not January 6th either. That's, that's June 1st, 2020. And that's the streets of D.C. that are being rioted and pillaged, and pillaged or by, by rioters. Where's the outrage? Where's the hotline? This is what domestic terror looks like. This is not a school board meeting. There is no hotline for any of these riots and we are going to have a hotline that's going to report parents for caring about their children's education. And even further, the DOJ would rather investigate a thousand more people from January 6th than any single person in these photos. What a shame. And that is why this is no longer the Department of Justice. It is the Department of Subjective Justice. And with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes next gentleman from Georgia. Representative Wesley Hunt. Uh, he serves as U.S. Representative for Texas 38th Congressional District. He was first elected in 2023 and serves on the House Judiciary Committee as well as the House Subcommittee on the Constitution and Limited Government. 
He received his uh, Bachelor of Science from the United States Military Academy at West Point. After serving eight years in the United States Army, he attended Cornell University, where he obtained a Master's of Business Administration and Public Administration and Industrial Labor Relations. You're a busy guy. <laughs> We're honored to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Congressman Hunt, proceed. Thank you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Graham for having me here today to speak about voting rights in America, the country that I love dearly. More importantly, I'm here to talk about the left's soft bigotry of low expectations. Because it's the Democrat Party, not the Republican Party, that thinks so little of black America as a people of color that they make the case that being black in America means we can obtain a government ID to vote. And that's not only a ridiculous assertion, it's demeaning and it's insulting. When it comes down to it, many of my colleagues on the left like to pretend that we're still living in the 1950s. Well, we're not. I've got some good news for you. It's 2024, and I know what year it is because I've been black for just over 40 years. And I'm also the son of a retired lieutenant colonel who grew up in a segregated South. You see, my parents grew up in a Jim Crow South in the 50s and 60s in New Orleans, Louisiana. Their next generation, my parents had three kids. My sister, brother, and I all went to West Point, all three of us. We all served our country in combat. And I sit before you today as a sitting United States congressman in a district in a suburb of Houston, Texas, that's a white majority district, that President Trump would have won by 25 points and I won by almost 30 points. And that doesn't happen unless we've made some incredible progress in this great nation. Now, my colleagues on the left like to say that common sense voting laws, including requiring a government issued ID, are racist, and discriminatory, and burdensome. Do you know what my father had back in the 40s and 50s before it was even cool? A government issue ID. And continuing in his footsteps, I, too, have multiple government-issued IDs. And while that might be shocking to many people in this country, people may ask, how does that happen? It's very simple. It's personal responsibility for all Americans in this country, regardless of what you look like. Sitting with me today is my global entry card, my military ID card, my Texas driver's license, my Texas license to carry, because that's how we roll in Texas my congressional card, and of course, the good old-fashioned American passport. What sorcery is this? What am I, the, the, the black Houdini? How was I able to pull off the impossible and attain not one, not two, not three, but six government issue IDs? Personal responsibility in this country. I fought for this country as an Apache helicopter pilot to protect free and fair elections. And having a government-issued ID isn't racist, it's American. You need to have an ID to drive a car, to check into the airport, open a bank account. You need an ID for basically everything to be a responsible adult in this country, except for voting, apparently, according to the left. Black America does not need well-meaning liberals putting their arms around us to telling us how we should go to the polls. In fact, if you look at recent headlines and polls, you will find that black men specifically in this country are more fired up than ever to participate in the next presidential election. And I think I know why, and I'm really looking forward to these results. For the record, in, 20, in the 2022 midterms in Georgia, it proved that election integrity and ballot accessibility can be achieved hand in hand. After the 2020 election, Georgia passed a voter election integrity law, and subsequently, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the state of Georgia alleging that the Georgia law is discriminatory and aims to restrict citizens from voting. President Biden even called this law, called this law and I quote, Jim Crow 2.0. Really? In my humble opinion, referencing Jim Crow for common sense election integrity laws is offensive to those who actually experienced Jim Crow, like my parents and their parents before them. In fact, the law wasn't discriminatory at all, because in the 2022 midterms, Georgia voters shattered voter turnout records across the state. And despite that record-breaking turnout in Georgia, the DOJ lawsuit is still pending. I suspect that it's because that record-breaking turnout resulted in a, in a Republican governor being elected in Georgia, but I digress. I'm gonna say the choir part out loud, which I tend to do. I have a lot of respect for John Lewis, 
but the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is not about protecting voting rights. It's about solidifying Democrat power nationally. It's about federal control over state and local elections, which, by the way, is unconstitutional. It's about diminishing the security of our elections. And voter integrity laws aren't discriminatory. They are required for a functioning constitutional republic. I'm going to tell you today, I categorically reject the soft bigotry of low expectations. Black Americans and people of color are proud. We expect more of ourselves. That's what black excellence really means to me. And above all else, we don't need a new solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Let me be clear. Making it to the polls to vote in person with an ID in this country today is a very low bar, extremely low bar. We can do it. White people can do it. Black people can do it. Americans can do it. And we should all want that for free and fair elections. If you want to be on the right side of history, you should reject, reject the Democrats' party's attempt to wind the clock back 70 years. Because I'm sitting right here in front of you, and I'm here to tell you we've come a long way. Let's continue this progress. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, sir, for having me. Thank you, Congressman. We'll now switch to our second panel. If the witnesses for the second panel will start to come forward, we'll start shortly. I thank everyone for their patience. Let me introduce the majority witnesses.
cao thông được nỗi vắng xa người thương màu hoa phượng thắm như máu con tim mỗi lần hè sang kỷ niệm người xưa biết đâu 